Okay, so this morning, as part of the conference, this message is going to be, as part of the conference, is geared towards fathering. And there you go. It's up there already. You know, Jesus made it really clear, you know, that to know the Father was eternal life. He said, hey, to know you is eternal life. And that's, you know, we've been talking about that the last couple of weeks, to know the Father is eternal life. And that's, that's what it is. It's, it's about knowing the Father, knowing the Father's heart, knowing who he is in relationship to you, and being able to receive that love so you can give it. And when we talk about fathering, we can look at Jesus. He's the perfect example of the Father. He's the exact representation of the Father, right? We you know, we know that. Um, well, we should know that. You know, Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. He only did what the Father did. He only said what the Father said. And his whole message was all about the fathering. You know, how do we pray our Father? You know, he was trying to get us to be included into that, that message of like, wait, no, he's your Father too. Now, Jesus told he told parables, and I love, I love parables. I think they're awesome. You know, they really make a good, really, Jesus was a really good storyteller. He was a really good storyteller, and he could really make his point well, well made in a, in a parable. And one of the most, probably everybody in this room, I would venture to say, has heard the story of the prodigal son. Right? Everybody, if you haven't, you're about to hear it. Praise God. It's one of my favorites. And you can't talk about in my mind, you can't talk about fathering from a biblical perspective without bringing up the story of the prodigal son. So, if you would do me the great honor and turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. And there are couple, there's some things I really want to point out about this. Jesus is he's about to tell the, the parable of the what we call the the story of the parable of the prodigal son. But if you look at the the first verse under uh, in in chapter 1, it says, Now tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's kind of the introduction to this this whole chapter. Then Jesus tells them a parable of the lost sheep. Then he tells them the parable of the lost coin. Then he tells them the parable of the lost son. Or I call it the, the, the story of the loving father, the, parab- the parable of the extravagant father. And I'm going to start in uh, verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So, he divided the property between them. It's, it's really interesting what's not being said here. You know, Jesus doesn't say, so the father begged and pleaded, please don't go. He said, it's actually, he doesn't say anything. He just says, hmm, here you go. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in a wild living. After he had spent everything... There was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Notice he's actually, this is what he rehearsed. He's like saying what he exactly rehearsed. I am no longer worthy to be your son. 
But the father interrupts him and he says, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. And he's speaking to his servants. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he was found. So they celebrate. Father God, we love you. We thank you. We just right now, in Jesus' name, we just pray for all the lost sons, all the lost daughters. We know your heart for them, Lord. We know your heart for them. We know your heart for our lost brothers and sisters. And right now, we just pray that the laborer comes across their path, Lord. We just pray to the Lord of the harvest that the laborers come across the path and reap that harvest and turn those people back, people that have walked away, walked away from their families, walked away from your family, Lord. We just pray that their hearts get pricked today, that their hearts get turned today back to you, back to their family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So they began to celebrate. All right, now this is where we're going we're gonna to take a pause here. Because a lot of times, like when I heard this story, like so many times, like I didn't even realize it went past verse 24. Like that's pretty much the story that we all know. Like, oh my gosh, the father was so extravagant. And this is, this is a story about the extravagant love of the father. For real. I mean, that's what it is. It's a story about grace. It's about, man, this, this son, this wild son, asked for inheritance, which, you know, depending on how you look at the traditions of that time, he may not have even deserved what he got at all, much less getting it early. He was the second born. The first born was supposed to get like the majority of things. So the father divided. It doesn't say he gave it 50-50 or anything, but he said he gives it to him, doesn't argue with him, lets him go, lets him go and make his own choices, make his own decisions. You know, it doesn't say the son was 12 or 22 or 32 or 42. It just says the younger son. And so the father lets him go. Son goes off, squanders it in wild living. Doesn't give a whole lot of details about what wild living looks like, but we can imagine wild living. Money is all gone. And then it says that famine hits. It doesn't say that the son lived wildly and all of a sudden his money was gone. It says he squandered his money, famine hits, so it's like a double whammy. He's broke. Oh, now everybody's broke. So he's like twice as broke. He's living with pigs, living in the, you can imagine what that was like. Not very fun, not very good. He's Jewish. You know, Jewish people and pigs, they don't, it's not kosher. You know, the whole kosher thing is really bad. And he's feeding pigs and he's like trying to eat the pig food. Really, really bad. Like, worst case scenario bad, okay? Worst case scenario. You know, basically he's diver, you know, uh, dumpster diving for food with animals that he thinks are the devil. So, he's coming back to his senses. He it says he comes to his senses. He comes to himself and he's just like, man, what am I doing here? Like, this is so stupid. I wanna, I'm going to go back and work for my father because his servants get treated better than I'm getting treated. And I'm in a place I hate. I hate, I, I don't, I hate this. This is awful. I'm going to go back and work for him because there's no way. I, you know, and he, he knew, like, the son doesn't, <laughs> son understands karma. He understands karma. He gets it. Karma. He doesn't get grace because he's like, man, I do not deserve to be treated any, any better than a servant. But at the same time, he's thinking, but I don't deserve to be treated any worse than a servant. I can go back and get a job. I'm capable. I can work. I'll go back and get a job. I'll be treated like a servant because I will be a servant. I'll get what I deserve, throw myself at his mercy and work and get what I deserve. He comes back. The father sees him coming, and he runs to him. Like he says, he, he runs. Like, you know, in the culture of that time, fathers didn't run. Men, distinguished gentlemen, men, you know, this guy has property, he has an estate, he has servants. They didn't like hike up their, their shorts and start taking off and running. That was like a big deal. And then he throws his arms around him, kisses him. And he, it's like total acceptance, total, like, I'm glad you're coming back. But you see, there was repentance on the son's part. There was repentance. He came back. He acknowledges, I really screwed up. I'm coming back. Father sees the repentance. He sees the son coming to him, and he meets him on the road. He meets him on the road. He doesn't make, oh, here he comes. <laughs> Let's go a long walk, boy. I'm going to watch you make every step. It's not like that. You know, the son's beating down, the boy's sweating, father's standing there. <whistles> not like that. 
He's like, whoa, there he is. He's coming back. I've been waiting for this day. Boom. Goes and gets him. Throws his arms around him. Hugs him. Kisses him. They put the sandals on. They put the robe on. They put the ring on his finger. It's party time. Now that's where we're going we're gonna to pick up right there at party time. Because there's three characters in this story. Three main characters. There's the father, Gary, if I could have you volunteer for that. Uh, there is the younger son, if I could have you do that. <laughs> Noah, if I could have you be the older son. That would be awesome. Okay, so there's three characters in this story. <laughs> now, we have, we have the, the father, who's just, here you guys, I'm going to put you right in the center. Older son, you stay off to the side, right? You're not in the story yet. So we got the father, sees the son, son's coming back, oh. boom, just like that. Boom, gives him a big smoochie, big smoochie. Where's the robe? Okay, the servants come. They put the robe on him. And there's, it's, get up. Get up. Yeah, seriously. Seriously, get up. Okay. Get the calf. It's party time. Okay, guys, you're going into the house, and you're going to party. These guys are here partying. Now, you guys just party on. Party on here. Party on silently. There you go. They're having a party. Okay, meanwhile, the older son, he's over here. What's he doing? He's working. Like he always does, because he works hard all the time, faithful, hardworking, working hard. Meanwhile, the older son is in the field, where he always is, working hard. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. <laughs> he says, so he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? I said, your brother has come home. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he came back safe and sound. Now, instead of the older brother being like, woohoo, this is awesome, he's like, dang it. <laughs> the older brother becomes angry and he refuses to go into the house. Okay, get this picture. Wait, wait, you're getting ahead of yourself. Oh. Hang on, pops. <laughs> I mean, father. He's, he's, he's refusing to go into the house. So it actually says the father went outside the house. Now I want you to get this picture. Okay, pause. Son was coming down the driveway. Father runs to meet him. Son repented. Father runs to meet him. This guy, older brother, older son, outside. I'm not coming in. I don't want anything to do with this. Father goes outside to meet him. You see there's a difference here. Father's going outside to meet him. And he says, hey, come on. Your brother, he says, he says, your brother has come home. But he answered his father. He says, look, after all these years, I have been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when, now here's the part I really want you to pay attention to because I miss this a lot. He says, but when your son comes home, you killed the fatted calf for him. Okay, get this. He said, look, after all these years, I have been doing all this work for you. Now your son comes home, and you killed the fatted calf for him. Do you see something here? This guy, this, the older brother, or the older son, he wants to be known as the older son. He wants to be his father's son, but he doesn't want to be his brother's brother. Do you see, the diff you see what's going on here? He's like, hey, I want to be your son, but I don't want to be this loser's brother. Okay? <laughs> I picked you because I knew you could handle it. Okay? <laughs> but you see what I'm saying here? He says, I want to be your son, but I'm not going to be this guy's, I'm not going to be this guy's brother. Okay? He wants to be the father's son, but he doesn't want to be his brother's brother. Why? Well, because he's been working hard. He's been doing all this stuff for dad, which he doesn't even call him father. He doesn't even address him as the father. He doesn't even call him father. He doesn't call him dad. He just says, look, boom, 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 your son. And the father says, 
my son, he's speaking, to, he's speaking to the older son now, he says, my son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your brother that was dead is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. And that's the end of the story. We don't hear if the brother comes inside. We don't hear if the, old, the younger brother goes outside. Maybe they move the party to the patio. I don't know. Jesus leaves us hanging because it's a choice. All right? But I want you to, uh, there's some things I really want to point out in this story. Like the father did not stay in the house. The father could have just been, you know, come back here, Dad. The father could have just been here. You know, hey, I don't know why he's ticked off. Doesn't make any sense to me. He should be happy. We're just going to keep partying. No, the father's heart is turned towards his children, whether they've been with him the whole time or whether they've been off. You know, this is a story of the loving father and his two, and his two very different sons. That could be the title of it. Two very different sons. Now, even in the beginning of this story, the younger son comes to the father and he says, Father, he addresses him. He addresses him with respect. You know, even though they say, hey, you know, he was actually saying, I wish you were dead so I could get my inheritance. I don't know, that's not the way it's presented to me. It just is like you got this young, young guy, younger person, crazy, wants to party. I want to go ruin my life. And father's like, hey, you know what? You're of age. Here you go. Do, you know, I'll be here for you when you need me. And not that the father approved of it, but he approved of him, him having free will. And then when things get wrecked, because, you know, the difference between, you know, Paul talks about you have many teachers, but not many fathers. Like a teacher, like the, this is an example of a father being a father. The father could have, when he saw the son coming, if he would have been in, in a strict like teacher mode, he said, he would have, this is a teachable moment, everyone. See, the son that asked for his early money has ruined his life. I want everyone to make note of how you can go from here to here. No, he's a father in this moment, and he says, whoa, I'm going to embrace you. I'm going to love you because I am here for you when things are good. And I am here for you when things go bad, because I'm your father and I always love you no matter what. Now, but that same extravagant love is also expressed towards the older son. Now, in this story, I really believe that, you know, that if you look at verse 1, the older son is representative of the people that are in the church or in, the, you know, in this context, in the temple. The people that have been like really trying to serve God, you know, because in the, even with the scribes and Pharisees, there were scribes and Pharisees that put their faith in Jesus, right? I mean, we knew that. You know, they were practices, practices, they practiced the law, but some of them actually believe, hey, you know what? Hey, this guy's proved himself to be the Messiah. I'm going to believe in him. You know? And so there's, there's, there's that element going on here where Jesus is saying, hey, you've been faithful. You've been faithful. You have been faithful. Now here's your opportunity to, to embrace with the Father's love. Now, I believe this, this parable is so for today. So for today, and so for the church today, and we have we have we have people coming into the church that have been that have walked away. We're going to have a lot more people coming into the church that have walked away. People that have never been part of the church. People that have been part of the church. You know, they got saved when they are ten, whatever. They've walked away. You guys can go ahead and sit down. I like I don't like I like having company up here. Um, but we have we have all these people that have that are going to be coming into the church, and then there's us who have been here. You know, and this, and this is a really good application for Victory Center because we're coming up on our two-year anniversary. You know, there's us who have, who have been here since the beginning. We've been here for, you know, two years or been with us even before the beginning. And you're like, man, I've been here from, I've been here from the beginning. And, and now there's new people coming in. And, you know, and then, and then there's us who have been walking with the Lord for 10, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And all of a sudden a new person comes in and they, they encounter God in a, an incredible way. And we're like, ah. Oh, Instead of being excited for him, sometimes we can get jealous for him. And not in a good, not a good jealous, like, but in a bad jealous. We get envious. And we can look at the Father and we can cross our arms and we can be like, hey, what's up with this? Like, I've been working really hard. I've been serving you really hard. I've been, I've been, I've been diligent. I never walked away from you. I'm not like that younger son. I'm not like, I'm not like that guy. Oh, my gosh. You know? And in fact, you know, Luke even said when he came up here, and I, I, you shared your testimony openly, um, when he said, wow, this is, my, this is my testimony. I was the prodigal son. You know, I mean, he was the prodigal son. 
And we have, really, we have real prodigal. We have real life prodigal sons in this house. Those of you watching by home, do not attempt this. No, but we have, we have, we have, we have real life prodigals in this house. You know, there's a lot of us who have been in those shoes who have come in and now we're, we're in this place where we're serving God and, and we're, we're, the Father's embraced us and he saw, our, he saw our true repentance and he's embraced us. But now there's this opportunity for those of us who have been diligent, who have been serving, who have never, man, we've never missed a Sunday. We've never missed a Sunday. Man, we were always there. We always serve. We always show up. We've been in the field every single day. But somehow we miss the Father's heart. Because there's no way the older brother, the older son, could have stood out here with his arms crossed and been angry if he would have known the Father's heart. There's just, it, it would literally be impossible. Because, first of all, even if, and I, I went through this many, I went through this in my head a lot. So this is the first time I've seen this stuff a lot. So even if my brother came home and he was a real dork, like he's just like the biggest idiot in the world. Like, I can't believe what you put mom and dad through. I, I am, oh, like you're the last person I want to see. I was hoping I ever see you again. But you, for, you know, it doesn't say how long he was gone. Let's say he was gone for two or three or four or five years. Long enough for a famine, long enough. He's gone for a long time, far away country. It probably took a couple years to get there and a couple years to get back. So he's gone for like three, four years. Over that three or four year period, the older brother had to notice like the pain that the father was going through. He had to notice like, man, like my dad's really upset that, you know, my, my little brother's not around. Like even, even if he thought, I never want to see this guy again, but for the sake of my dad, I'm glad he came home. I will probably never talk to him after this party gets done. But for the sake of my dad, I'm glad he's here. That's not what, that wasn't his reaction. His reaction was like, you know what? I'm done. I don't want anything to do with these guys. So he, he shuts himself off from his father and his brother because he doesn't understand his father's heart. And that's what the, this last, last two or three weeks, that's really what we've been driving at is understanding the father's heart understanding the Father's heart so that you don't put yourself in this position where you want to be the Father's child, but you don't want to be your brother or sister's brother or sister. You want to be your Father's child. You've been working hard. You've been in the fields. You've been toiling. You've been struggling. You've been, you've been doing everything. You've not disobeyed anything the Father has commanded you to do. But Jesus has given us a new command. <laughs> Remember the new command? Love, love your neighbor as yourself. Like, you, you have to, that's his command. Like, that's his command. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. And in this scenario, this, this older brother, this religious older brother, he has not received the love of the father. He has not received the father's heart. He has not gotten connected to the father's heart. He is actually loving his brother the way he thinks his father is loving him based on his performance. That's what this whole story is about. It's based on his performance. And that's when he says, I did this, I did this, I did this. What's going on? That's how he relates to the father and what he can do for the father. And the father's just like, hey, come on. All I have is yours. It's always been yours. All you got to do is ask. Let's, we, have to, we have to celebrate now. He's trying, to, he's trying to pull the brothers together in a celebration of life, in a celebration of victory. And that's what God's trying to do here this morning. He's trying to pull us together in this place of celebration so that whether we've just come into the kingdom, whether we've just come back to our Father, whether we've just stepped back into this place of, oh man, repentance, why don't we call it that? Repentance, where we turned and said, what am I thinking? This is awful. I really squandered. I, really, I have totally messed this up. And we turn, and bam, there's the Father, just like that. You guys want a replay of the hug? It was so good. We can watch it again on, on the live stream. We'll rewind it. But bam, there's the hug, just like that. You repent, there's the Father. He's quick to embrace, quick to forgive. 
bam, he's already forgiven you, actually. He's just waiting for you to turn around and accept it. And then there's the older brother serving diligently, not connected to his heart, not connected to the father's heart. This morning, the father wants us all to be connected to his heart. The father wants us to understand his extravagant love. Having this love that responds and says, you know what? This is grace. This is all about grace. It is not about what I deserve. It has never been about what I deserve. And it will never be about what I deserve. Because I don't get what I deserve. I get what Jesus deserves. Because he took what I deserved. He took it. And that was the whole point of this story. And I, 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 I wanted you guys to see it in a different perspective. Because, yeah, it's about grace. The whole story is about grace. But it's about us in this room who are older brothers who need to understand this message of grace so that we can have the Father's heart so we can love other people the way he loves them. We have to be able to see other people the way he sees them. We have to be able to see ourselves the way he sees us. He is never going to relate to you based on how you serve him. He's going to be happy. He's going to be happy with you. Wow, that's awesome. But you need to serve him out of a place of identity that he loves you no matter what. Like you can't make him love you more. You can't make him love you less. Because if you, if you start to relate to him based on your works, you're going to start to relate to others based on their works. And it's going to be about performance every time. Like that's a, that's a, that is a formula for failure. That is a formula for blocking the extravagant love of the Father. And we need to get to this place where we understand how he loves us. You need to come to grips with, with grace and realize, oh, this is for me. So you can share it with other people. So you can be extravagant in your love. So you can be extravagant in your life. Yeah. <laughs> this afternoon, I'm going to be talking a little bit. Um, we have a 2 o'clock session. And I'm going to be talking a little bit, just a little bit about um, courageous love and courageous, being a, having a courageous life and having courageous love. And this is going to flow into that. Because if you can't understand how to, how to be courageous in your love, you're not going to be able to have a courageous life. And as a father, as a, as a father and as a mother, like you have to be able to love courageously. The father in this parable, he loved courageously. He loved courageously. He didn't care what the neighbors thought. <laughs> he didn't care what his servants thought. He didn't care what his, what his older son thought. He didn't care what the younger son thought. He didn't care what anybody thought. He loved courageously. And that's the love that God is calling us into. If you can love courageously, you can live courageous, courageously. And that's what it's about. God has called us to live courageously. So, Father, we thank you for your amazing and courageous love. We thank you for bringing us to a place of understanding your heart, of understanding your grace. We thank you for giving us this, this, this anchor, this, this seal, this Holy Spirit that you have sealed us with, that just reveals all truth to us, Lord. Father, I just ask anybody who needs a deeper revelation of your love this morning, I just ask that right now in the name of Jesus, you just open your heart and your mind to a deeper revelation. Just let the Holy Spirit just reveal a deeper revelation, a deeper understanding of that love. Because you can, you can literally, you can sit at the same table as the Father. You can work in His fields. You can be in the same room with Him and never get that heart connection. God is calling us all to a heart connection. He is calling you to a heart connection. He's very thankful for what you do for Him. He is thankful for what you do. But that doesn't make Him love you anymore. He loves you because He loves you. So, Father, we thank you for your extravagant love. Amen. <laughs>